In this video, we're going to take an in-depth look at the technique of ultrasound guided IV placement. I'm Matt Wall, I'm a nurse and clinical educator with Echonos, a company that develops intelligent medical tools to empower you, nurses and healthcare providers, to enhance the way that you deliver medical care. Today I'm going to start by sharing my experience with learning ultrasound guided IV. Then we'll jump into how to get set up and prepared. And finally, we'll cover the actual technique for IV placement. I thought I'd start out by sharing my story with you about how I learned ultrasound guided IV. And hopefully it gives you a little insight to what your learning process might be like. The way I like to describe this is by comparing my confidence level against the number of attempts I made with ultrasound. So before I ever made my first ultrasound attempt, I was an experienced pediatric emergency room nurse as well as a paramedic with lots of difficult IV experience. So I thought I was gonna roll into this class and ace this ultrasound thing. You could say I was a little overconfident. So at point zero, we'll plot my confidence level right about here. And then I attempted my first IV with ultrasound and it wasn't pretty. This was a bit of a reality check and I realized I was gonna to have to do some work. But I persisted had lots of different feelings along the way, and I got to the first milestone of 10 attempts. At 10 attempts, I was starting to work independently without a preceptor. And literature shows that once you reach 10 attempts, your success rate increases to about 85%. And I noticed I was starting to gain some confidence. At 30 attempts, the literature shows that your success rate increases to around 95%. And it was at 30 attempts that I became a super user and started precepting other students. Now at around a thousand sticks is when I started leading a program for ultrasound guided IV. And what I noticed as an instructor is that the time period covering your first 10 attempts is a particularly vulnerable time for new users. I call this the dropout zone where I see learners get frustrated and give up. Now I'm pointing this out because I want you to be aware of this. It's normal to be frustrated, but the trick is to push through your first 10 sticks and you'll gain confidence and your success rate dramatically increases. So get those 10 sticks in and don't give up. All right, now let's look at what steps need to be completed before IV placement. We're gonna talk about practice standards, preparation goals, probe handling, and general setup. Knowing your clinical setting is essential for safe and successful practice. You need to have a clear understanding of your policies and procedures regarding ultrasound guided IV placement. Get to know the supplies available to you. You should know ahead of time the length and type of IV catheter, the types of ultrasound probe covers, and the type of ultrasound gel that should be used. Remember, individual packets of ultrasound gel are preferred over larger shared bottles of ultrasound gel due to infection risk. Get to know the expectations and locally accepted practices in your unit or care area. For example, do specific indications need to be met prior to ultrasound guided IV, such as completing a vascular assessment tool on the patient to determine their degree of difficult access? What are the expectations regarding documentation? And what are the cleaning products and methods you are expected to use when cleaning the device? For more information on compatibility of the Echinose vein with cleaning and low-level disinfection agents, review the technical bulletin entitled Echinose Compatible Cleaning and Disinfection Agents. Preparation is key for setting yourself up for successful IV placement. This will ensure your procedure runs smoothly and it helps you project confidence. First, prepare yourself. Of course, wash your hands as this is the number one way of preventing hospital-based infections. Gather the necessary supplies of ultrasound guided IV placement. It can be helpful to have a pre-made ultrasound guided IV supply bundle, or you could stock these supplies in a single location. This can be a huge time-saving hack especially when needing to get IV access in emergency situations. Prior to entering the patient space, conduct a quick mental walkthrough of your steps. This can help identify missing supply items and refresh the steps for IV placement in your mind. Prepare the patient. 
explain to the patient in detail the steps of ultrasound guided IV placement. This may be a new procedure for the patient and they may have a few questions. This will set clear expectations for the patient, minimizing surprises and ensuring they are fully informed and on board. Prepare the device. Ensure the device is clean and if necessary, clean the device before use. Power on the Echinose vein system and check battery life. Having the device power off in the middle of the procedure would likely lead to unsuccessful IV placement and it damages patient confidence. Complete the system setup by selecting the vascular option and applying the appropriate presets. Apply a probe cover based on institutional standards. Lastly, prepare the environment. Make sure the room is set up and the ultrasound machine should be placed at the head of the bed so that you can easily see the screen and the patient. The patient should be comfortable and sit facing you. Let's look at an image of a typical room setup. Notice how the clinician in this picture is facing the patient. The patient's arm is extended, making it easily accessible. It's ideal to have the ultrasound machine positioned on the same side of the patient as yourself, as seen here. This puts the device within reach, allowing you to access the image adjustment features such as depth and gain during the procedure. Depending on the room setup and available space, the device may need to be positioned on the opposite side of the patient, but just remember you likely won't be able to reach the screen for adjustments. Let's take a look at the steps you'll need to complete before cannulation. Let's take a look at how we're going to handle the ultrasound probe. So the first thing is that you want to hold the probe in your non-dominant hand. Now I'm right-handed, so that means I'll be holding it in my left hand. This is going to feel a little bit awkward at first, but it's important so that you have your dominant hand free to hold the needle tip. Now, after you hold it in your non-dominant hand, you're going to want to orient the probe. So there's a small probe marker on the side here, and this needs to match up with the probe marker on the screen. So in this case, the probe marker is here on the left side of the screen. So I'm going to make sure that my probe marker is oriented to the left side of the probe and not flipped. So left and left. Once I've oriented my probe, I want to make sure that I'm using a C grip to hold the probe. So kind of make a C with your hand, grab the probe, and then you'll place it on the patient. Now make sure that you're holding lower on the probe and not higher up. It's really easy to put too much pressure into the probe. So hold lower down on the probe, and this also allows you to anchor your fingers. So using these fingers here, I'm going to anchor, which again gives me more control. You really don't want to put too much pressure into the probe. I see a lot, of, uh, a lot of students that are scanning somebody's arm and they can't find a vein anywhere. I'll remind them, hey, relax your pressure a little bit, and they do, and suddenly the veins pop back into view. So you could almost imagine that the probe is a paintbrush where you're just kind of delicately painting or even that you're kind of hovering just above the skin so that you could slide a piece of paper under there. All right, now that you've got a handle on your ultrasound probe, we're gonna look at vein mapping so you can find a vessel to cannulate. The first thing you wanna do is apply a tourniquet to your patient. This is going to increase the pressure in the vessel, making the vessel appear larger. And it's also gonna make it easier for the needle to puncture the vessel. Just remember that if you're calculating a vessel to catheter ratio, this should be done without a tourniquet. So the first thing we're gonna do is apply some gel to the patient, which in this case is gonna be me. So starting in the antecubital region is helpful because your vessels are larger in this area, making them easier to find. So you kind of scan around and once you locate a vessel, and there's a nice big one, you want to track it down to the forearm area, which is the better location for needle insertion. So we'll keep this in the center of the screen and start tracking it down. Now notice how the vessel, the vein doesn't just run straight down my arm. It kind of flows with the contour of my arm. So I need to flow with it. So I've got it in the center of the screen, tracking it down to the mid forearm. 
There we go. Great. Now, if you remember from the first video, you can also make a C with your hand, C for cephalic, and follow that straight up your arm to the mid forearm area, and you should right, run right into the cephalic vein. And there's mine right there. You got a little more gel. So there is my cephalic vein. So once you've located your vessel, you want to go ahead and track up and track down, making sure that your vessel is nice and round and straight. And you also want to look for things to avoid, such as a confluence. And actually, I can see one right here, two vessels flowing together. So I would either start above or below that. You also want to avoid um, a thrombus or valves or nerve bundles. All right, so now that you've located a vessel, you want to ask yourself, is this the best possible spot I can go for this patient for needle placement, right? You've avoided the upper arm, you've avoided the joints, and the mid forearm is really kind of should be your go-to spot. So we've located the vessel. Now we need to complete a compression test. A compression test is going to allow, allow us to rule out a thrombus by fully collapsing the vessel. So the vein should fully collapse easily. And then we also want to do a partial collapse to see if it pulsates. So this one is fully collapsible with little pressure and it does not pulsate. If it pulsates, it's an artery. The compression test can also be done as you're vein mapping. So you end up doing kind of little compression tests as you go along checking your vessel. So that way you're not missing a thrombus anywhere along the vein. So now that we've located our insertion point, we want to go ahead and center the vessel on the screen. Let's say, oh, there's that confluence. So we'll go above it. So I'll center it on the screen right there using my guidelines. And if it's centered on the screen, then I know it's centered on the probe and I can aim my needle for the center of the probe. In this case, though, I'm going to go ahead and put a mark where my insertion point is going to be using the back of the needle. So a little bit of pressure there. I've marked my location. Uh, remember to take off the tourniquet and give your patient a break. And then we'll talk about how to prep the area. A quick note about angling the probe to make your vein mapping flow better. If you were to slide the probe down the patient's arm without being in plane with the vein, you would constantly have to course correct to keep it in the center of the probe. Let's see what this would look like. Watch how we map down the arm, but then have to shift over to recenter the vein. We keep having to move down and over, down and over, which results in this zigzag or stair step pattern. To avoid this, simply rotate the probe to be in plane with the vein. Now we're able to move smoothly down the arm. By angling the probe with the vein, you get a more direct path for vein mapping and can more easily keep the vein centered in the probe. Preparing the patient's skin really shouldn't be too different than what you're already doing for regular IV placement. And it's going to be based off your institutional standards. Make sure you wash your hands and apply a pair of gloves. The first thing you want to do is wipe away the old gel. Next, you're going to clean the site. And this will be done with whatever your institution sets forth in their policy. Next, you'll apply some sterile gel. Again, I like to use these individualized little packets. So I'm applying it over the mark that I made previously. And at this point, I'm ready to place my ultrasound probe back on the patient and line up my needle. Let's pause here and talk about techniques for needle advancement. First, we'll discuss insertion angles for needle placement. You can easily overthink insertion angle, and it's something that you'll get an intuitive feel for over time. But let's talk about a few general principles. Notice the positioning of this needle here. It is placed at about 45 degrees, which is not too low or too high. This will be a good angle for most of your vessels, especially those ranging in the depth from one to two centimeters. Now, if we increase the angle of insertion by raising up on the needle, 
we will reach a deeper position much faster. This is good for getting to those deeper vessels more quickly. And if we decrease the angle of insertion by lowering the needle, well, we have a much more gradual descent of the needle, which is good for accessing shallow vessels. One quick tip for needle insertion uses what we know to be true about an isosceles right triangle. Now, I know it's probably been a little while since you've had high school geometry, but stick with me on this one. It's easy to determine the depth of a vessel by using the depth markings on the echinose vein system. So let's say we found the depth of this vessel to be 1.5 centimeters. If we were to come back from the probe 1.5 centimeters and insert the needle at a 45 degree angle, it creates the special right triangle and puts us in perfect alignment to hit the blood vessel. Now let's explore the technique for needle advancement. For needle advancement, we first center the vein on the ultrasound probe and align our needle to the center probe marker. Consider your angle of insertion and then advance the needle just until the needle tip intersects the ultrasound. Now, advance the probe forward. Next, advance the needle back into the ultrasound beam. You may notice we are taking incremental steps towards the blood vessel. This stepwise approach gives a fine degree of control as we advance the needle. Now, let's advance the probe and advance the needle. Notice the needle tip has now entered the blood vessel. Let's advance the probe again. However, if we advanced the needle on our current path, we would pass through the other side of the vessel. To prevent this, we will lower the needle as we advance. Let's make one more advancement of the probe and one more advancement of the needle. At this point, we are fully housed in the vein and can advance the catheter. A critical component of ultrasound guided IV placement is always knowing where the needle tip is. And this is complicated by the fact that the needle tip and any point along the shaft of the needle looks pretty much the same on ultrasound. Let's take a look at what I mean by this. Take a look at these two images. They appear very similar, showing a circular vessel with the reflective white dot of the needle. But one image is showing the needle tip, and the other is showing a point along the shaft of the needle. Let's see where the ultrasound is positioned on the needle to reveal which is which. In the first image, the ultrasound beam is at the tip of the needle, revealing that this is an image of the, of the needle tip. The second image shows the ultrasound beam along the shaft of the needle, revealing that this is an image of the needle shaft. Don't let this second image trick you, although it appears as if the needle tip is nicely positioned inside the vessel, since we now know that this is the shaft of the needle, by moving the probe, we are able to locate the actual tip of the needle and find it here, completely out of position. So now you might be wondering, how do we tell the needle tip from the needle shaft since they look so similar? There is a subtle sign you can look for to identify the needle shaft. It's reverberation artifact, and you can actually see it here in this image. Notice how it's not here in this image. But this is not always present, so we need a more reliable method for locating the needle tip. This is why we use the stepwise pause in advance approach previously described. Let's take a closer look at this method. Let's take a look at this pause in advance technique. So the first thing we'll do is apply gel to the practice block. There's actually a fair amount already on here. We'll go ahead and position our probe on the block and locate a vessel. Conveniently, we've got one right here. I'm going to go ahead and center the vessel on the screen so that way it's centered in the probe and now I know I can aim my needle right for the center of the probe. I've got my needle, it's bevel up. I'm lining it up with the appropriate insertion angle. I'm going to go ahead and insert the needle and slowly advance just until I see the needle tip come into view. 
and there I can actually see it moving the tissue around it. Sometimes you don't get a perfect view of the needle. So I know it's there. There's that tip. I'm going to probe away, pause, now advance my needle back into view, and boom, there it is, right in the center of the vessel. So this is the view you're looking for. We'll continue a few more advances. So I'm pausing, probing away until I lose sight of the needle tip. Now I'm going to advance the needle back into view. There it is again. Probe away and advance the needle. And there it is again. So you can see how I'm using this stepwise pause in advance. This allows me to know where the needle tip is at all times. So let's look at some examples of what happens when you don't always know where the needle tip is. In this first image, we're going to see what happens when you don't completely lose sight of the needle tip. Now this is showing you what you should not do. First we advance the needle, then advance the probe. Notice how the probe was moved forward but not far enough forward to the point where we lost view of the needle. We can see that the needle tip is almost through the other side of the vessel already, but we wouldn't know this based on our current imaging. So we would probably advance the needle more and advance the probe. And this is usually the point where you realize something funny is going on. You might advance the probe again a little more and realize you went completely through the vessel. Now, let's watch what happens when you lose the needle. This is what you should do. We advance the needle just until it comes into view. Then we advance the probe, completely losing sight of the needle. Again, advance the needle just as it comes into view, and it looks like we're about to break into the vessel. Advance the probe, and advance the needle. At this point, we would know our needle tip is fully in the vein, and we could begin to flatten out as we advance. You can see how our constant awareness of the needle tip by losing sight of the needle gives us good control and prevents us from over advancing and blowing the vein. Great work. That was a lot of material to cover in a short amount of time. And just remember, you can revisit these videos at any point in your learning process. Thank you and good luck with those ultrasound guided IVs.